Hello and welcome to today's tutorial organised by the Surgical Academy regarding the training involved to become a surgeon in the UK. My name is Dr Tiffany Marie Borg. I'm the founder of the Surgical Academy. The goal of the Academy is to support young aspiring surgeons with their career, including job applications, exams and clinical experience. A little background about myself. I am a London-based doctor. I trained at Barts in the London School of Medicine and Dentistry, Queen Mary University of London, and have since always worked in London. So, the course to become a surgeon is long and it involves a lot of commitment and hard work. However, it is doable and it is worth it. There are three main routes to become a surgeon in the UK. The first and most popular way to do it is via the official training pathway, and that's the focus of today's talk at the beginning. However, alternative routes include what's called a fixed term specialty training appointment and career grades. We'll discuss both of those as well today. So, in the UK, after completing med school, doctors have what's called a two year period of working as foundation doctor. This is known as foundation years one and foundation years two, F1 and F2. After completing these two years, doctors then decide to either go down the surgical route or the medical route. Both involve the targeted selection process and you'd have to interview both ways. Those of you who wish to pursue a surgical career, um, assuming all of you watching today, um, you then either enter what's called a core surgical training uh, program or a run-through program. Now, the run-through training pathway is when you enter directly into the specialty training of choice. This is only available for certain specialties, such as max bags and neurosurgery. It does change over time. So it's worth seeing what these are whenever you happen to be applying, um, which you can do via the Royal College website. The majority of aspiring surgeons will go down the core surgical training pathway route. So when you enter core surgical training, or rather CT1, CT2, you basically enter a two year period where you rotate through different surgical specialties. So this could be general surgery, trauma and orthopedics, plastic surgery, max bags, vascular, any, um, any of those specialties. By the end of that two year period, it's expected that the training surgeon will have achieved what's called core competencies, progress uh, to their next stage of specialty training. These core competencies include passing what's called the MRCS exam. This is a two-part exam that's run by the Royal College of Surgeons and it includes a written exam, part A, and an oral OSCE style exam, part B. Once you've completed your core surgical training and you've been successfully accepted into specialty training, you then have a six-year period where you work within the specialty of choice and you achieve training in that specialty. At the end of all of this, you sit what's called your final FRCS exam. And at that point, um, you then become qualified to then be eligible for, to be a consultant. At that point, many also choose to undertake a, a fellowship. And the reason for that is to increase the um, expertise within that specialty. I'm now gonna delve further into each aspect of training. So applicants for foundation training, um, those are usually the medical students in their final year of medical school. So applications are made very early on in the final year. So med students essentially list their locations of choice in the UK and then they are matched according to their rank out of all the applications. Now that matching and rank is based primarily on their performance in medical exams in med school and the SJT exam. That exam is sat in winter time and the SAT accounts for, at the time of recording, it accounts for 50% of your overall rank, whereas your medical exams from years one to final are uh, ranked differently and account for a different proportion of your overall ranking. Once you've qualified as a doctor, you'll work in an NHS clinical setting and you rotate through various medical and spe uh, surgical specialties every four months. In your second year, uh, foundation training, you'll then apply for your core surgical training. Now, your core surgical training application is made by your Oriel. This is the link here, and I highly recommend you, you see what's on there, in particular before you actually come to your core surgical training application. The reason for this is that this application will factor in what's called your portfolio. 
and it will break down different aspects of your portfolio and it changes every year. So it's worth trying to like get as much of it done as possible early on, so before you actually come into the run-up to your application. We will have a separate tutorial that explains how to prepare and make your portfolio as, as good as possible. As a core surgical trainee, you'll also work in a hospital, but this time you'll be rotating through surgical specialties. Depending on the post that you are matched to, this might actually be a theme surgical post. So, for example, if you want to pursue a career in plastic surgery, you might prefer to have a themed core surgical training post where you rotate through plastics, max facts, ENT, and orthopedics, rather than spending four to six months of your life doing general surgery. By the end of your core surgical training, it is expected that all trainees will have completed their clinical competencies and the MRCS exam. This is required to get into your spe specialty training. As discussed, specialty training is your six year period where you work in one of your 10 surgical specialties of choice. And at the end of this, you complete the FRCS exam and depending on personal choice, your fellowship. Once you've completed this FRCS exam, you'll attain what's called a certificate of completion of training if you've gone via the traditional training pathway route or the Certificate of Eligibility for Specialist Registration, CESA. And that's more commonly completed by those who go down the alternative pathway route. We'll discuss that later. Once you've completed these um, awards, you'll then be added to the GMC's list for specialist registration. And at that point, you're eligible to apply for a consultant post. So um, before today's tutorial, we had many, many questions. And one of these was, what if I don't make it at any point in time? Firstly, I'd like to say and really, really emphasize that it's becoming increasingly competitive to get through each of these hoops. So as a result, more and more trainees don't get into their core surgical training and they don't get into specialist training with the first application. Don't let this dishearten you. Do not give up if this is what you really want to do with your life. Okay? Take the opportunity to see where exactly in your application you weren't so great. So what, what is weak in your portfolio? It could be you don't have enough publications or you didn't have enough surgical cases in your logbook. Take the time to build on wherever you are weakest and then reapply. Okay, when you're taking this time, you could either take it working as an F3. So after doing your F1, F2 years, you do an F3 year, and that will still be working for the NHS. You just use the opportunity to work on your um, application. Alternatively, it could be after your course surgical training, um, where you don't get into specialist training. So you take a C3 year, a CT3 year, and it's essentially the same thing. We just enhance, enhance, enhance your application for the next time that you apply. There is a limit as to how often you can reapply. Um, if you max out your application and you still want to pursue this career, again, you don't have to give up. There is what's called the alternative pathway. You could do this alternative pathway after maxing out your training, like traditional training pathway applications, or you could do it earlier on. Now, what is this alternative pathway I'm talking about? This isn't something that's actually talked about very often amongst junior trainees. Um, but basically what it is, um, it's you still work with the NHS and you're still working in the specialty of choice as you would do for a standard training pathway. The difference is that it involves a lot more self-directed learning. So all of those competencies that are necessary to, for you to complete your specialist training you would have to achieve on your own terms. Now that can be more difficult, um, especially when you factor in what job within the specialty you might be allocated to. So for example, if your goal is to become a plastic surgeon, but you get allocated to a job that's primarily trauma or skin cancers or, or even burns, but you, you need to get a certain number of cleft cases because you might not rotate through a head and neck or a cleft rotation, it'll be harder for you to get the number of cleft cases in your logbook that you need. That being said, it is doable. Okay. This link is um, a useful link just to give you some more information about this alternative route.
So, I'm just going to start answering a few other very commonly asked questions. I think questions about the PLAB and confusion regarding what is this PLAB exam and do I need to sit it was the most common theme amongst trainees who are not in the UK. So just to go back to basics, to work as a doctor in the UK, you have to be fully registered with the General Medical Council. The most obvious way to get this full registration is by sitting the PAP exam. Now, there are actually options that allow you to bypass this exam. Now, the GMC actually has a list of all of these postgraduate qualifications that they accept for full registration. Of note, the MRCS exam is one of those. But also, if you're watching from overseas, they do accept some overseas qualifications. So it's worth checking out what, what there is on here and see if it tailors to what you've done so far. If you have a qualification that's actually not on the list, you can write to your, um, the UK Medical Royal College for the specialty of your choosing to see if they'll actually consider whether or not your qualification is equivalent. If they say no and you've tried everything, at that point your option is to sit the PLAB or one of the GMC listed exams. You could also gain sponsorship, which I'm going to discuss as well later today. Now, given that you need to sit the MRCS exam regardless, a lot of uh, junior doctors are really confused. Do I sit the PLAB exam or the MRCS? Now, Essentially, the MRCS qualification, because it's needed for most specialties, is a tempting option, but there are many factors to consider. So, for example, what is the pass rate? How much time do you have to prepare to sit an exam? Can you afford it? And what job uh, prospects are you going to have afterwards? If you've just come out of med school and you've not had that much exposure to surgery, the PLAB exam is the, mo the more logical option. The reason for this is because it doesn't require a lot of postgraduate specialist experience and it allows you to work in the UK more quickly. Also, given how the MRCAS Part B oral exam is, it's often advised that you, are, you do need some um, surgical postgraduate experience, in particular in a UK hospital because of the way that the exam is structured and the way that they expect the candidates to answer their questions. I've summarised the differences, the key differences between the MRCS and PLAB exam. As you can see, the MRCS has a much, much lower pass rate of only about a third of candidates passing the Part A exam. It also takes longer to prepare for and it is more expensive. However, the plus is that it is a qualification that you need for your specialty training. It is worth noting that to get your full GMC registration, you need to have passed both the Part A and the Part B of the MRCS exam. You can't just have passed Part A. So now some wonder, like, is it worth taking all that time and money into both the PLAB and then doing the MRCS, or can I just try and get it all done at once? The answer is you can save time and money by clearing the MRCS exam, but, and this is a massive but, if you're doing that, you're relying on the fact that you pass this exam the first time you sit it. Now, given that the MRCS has a much lower pass rate, it is worth factoring in whether or not you feel that you are able to pass it that first time around. The reason I'm stressing this is because there's only a certain number of times you can sit the MRCS exam. After that, you can't. And if you don't pass it after sitting your maxed out number of sits, you won't be able to get into your specialty training. Okay? Um, Generally, I have mentioned this, the passing of the MRCS exam is tied to how much postgraduate clinical experience you've had. So if you are fresh out of med school, consider the PLAB exam. Um, if you've had more training, it may make more sense for you to sit the MRCS exam instead of the PLAB. For those of you who just don't want to sit any exams, that's also an option. So what you can do is actually get GMC registration through what's called sponsorship. Now this might be a very appealing option to those who are outside of the UK. Um, there is what's called a medical training initiative. Now that's a kind of sponsorship that allows you to work in the UK for up to two years. And although your visa in the UK will allow you to work for two years, your GMC registration will then be permanent. And that may broaden your career prospects in the long term. 
I hope that was all very useful. These are the core links that I used for today's tutorial. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to message us. We are here to help and support you throughout your career. Um, and I hope that I hope today will help. Okay, take care and see you at our next tutorial.